Iceland, September 4th, 2004. After a summer of frantic prep fraught with problems and delays, the film Beowulf and Grendel is finally about to start shooting. Icelandic Canadian director Sturla Gunnarsson has asked Hilmar Orn Hilmarsson, the film's composer and also the high priest of the Old Norse religion in Iceland, to perform a pagan blessing, asking the gods to watch over the film's production. Immediately after the ceremony, the director falls and hits his head on the rocks. Crew members rush to his side with an old Icelandic proverb, a fall at the start makes for a profitable journey. But there would be nothing profitable or easy about the making of Beowulf and Grendel. Don't talk to me about that pagan blessing. Has anybody told you Roran's comment about the pagan blessing? <laughs> when Helmar was looking through his book of blessings and went, oh, <laughs> oh, wrong one. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I just put a curse on the movie. <laughs> I love Beowulf and Grendel. In my opinion, it's the most Viking Viking movie ever made. Sheep are just the tip of it. They say he tried it once with a dead walrus. He's tried horses. He's, he's tried goats. They say he once tried it with, with a rabbit and got stuck. Now, it's not super historically accurate. I'm sure that someone like Lindy Bage could easily tear it to pieces. Why are these chaps wearing chainmail while they're just sitting around on a boat? Are they expecting a battle? Ah, uh, there are problems with this baptism scene, as Denmark wasn't Christianized until 975 AD, and a title card at the beginning of the film clearly says that we're in the 6th century AD. Why would the Danes build a mead hall here? There's no good water, no access to the sea for trade and so forth, and no protection at all from the wind. It's on the edge of a cliff, for goodness sake! Whatever, it's a fantasy film with trolls and shit. Calm down, Lindy Beige. But Beowulf and Grendel feels very authentic. The costumes and sets are accurate enough to immerse you in the setting, which is more than I can say for most Viking movies and TV shows. <sighs> the savage beauty of the Icelandic landscape, beautifully shot on 35mm film, adds a mythic quality to every scene. Yeah, it looks nothing like Denmark where the film is set, but who cares? It looks amazing. The supernatural elements are subtle and totally believable in the world of the story. Again, this has the effect of really sucking you back in time in a way that you don't often see with movies set in this period. History Channel Vikings feels like a soap opera. The Last Kingdom, as much as I like it, feels like a knockoff of HBO's Rome. Beowulf and Grendel, though? It feels like a fucking Icelandic saga, man. It captures the spirit of the Viking Age in a way that no other movie has. If you're looking for a truly authentic Viking movie, you simply cannot get any better than this. The cast is stacked. Jared Butler's a great Beowulf, and he plays him with this kind of quiet, subdued masculinity. He's a tough guy, a natural leader, but he never advertises it. You can just tell by the way he holds himself. Rory McCann, the Hound, plays one of Beowulf's buddies, as does Tony Curran, a great character actor who you've seen in everything but whose name you didn't know until now. Every famous Icelandic actor who ever lived is in this movie, notably Olaf Olafsson and Ingvar Sigurdsson, whose portrayal of Grendel is incredibly original and bizarrely touching. Oh. Eddie Marsan is in it as a crazy epileptic monk. I shall see God! Come on. Even Sarah Polly shows up and collects a paycheck. But the best performance is Stellan Skarsgård as King Hrothgar. In this version of the story, Hrothgar is a depressed alcoholic, a broken man crippled by grief, and Skarsgård plays it to the absolute hilt. Ah. <laughs> and this isn't your typical retelling of Beowulf. Sure, it's R-rated, there's a lot of sex and violence and swearing and stuff, but on a deeper level, Beowulf and Grendel is a lot more thoughtful than it lets on at first. I said it was a Viking movie. I didn't say it was an action movie. In fact, there's only two or three action scenes in the whole fucking movie. Most of the time, Beowulf isn't going around slaying monsters. He's investigating why Grendel wants revenge, and slowly learning that his old buddy Hrothgar isn't telling him the whole truth. This movie's got a lot to say about the stupidity of intolerance and the pointlessness of violence. 
but the story of Beowulf and Grendel isn't nearly as intriguing as the story of how it got made. The documentary Wrath of Gods, directed by actor and filmmaker John Gustafsson, tells the whole harrowing story. The production almost ran out of money before filming even started. The British partners appear to be getting cold feet. Cash flow has stopped, and the production doesn't have enough money to pay our salaries this week. And even during principal photography, the producers struggled to close the financing. Late on a, on a, on a Thursday night, I just flew over to London and took a train to Brighton and showed up in their offices and stayed there until I had a signed agreement with them. I just stayed and hung around their offices and they tried to ignore me and I wouldn't go away. And I just, <laughs> just hung out with them and finally I came back with an agreement. And that, at that point I thought we had a film. The budget quickly blew out of control. Sometimes they didn't have enough money to pay the crew or even provide food and gas. We got into things like, is someone gonna get down to the bank in time to sign the paper today to get the money into the Icelandic bank tomorrow? pay the crew the next day. Crew members threatened to walk multiple times. I would like to apologize on behalf of myself as a producer for the difficulties that have been that we've had. The set was chaotic and unprofessional. A lot of the riders were drunk. And it was early in the morning and they were really drunk. We've had three pretty serious injuries on this movie. We've had them. Um, Many people fired for indiscretions. Then there was the weather. How do you feel about the uh, approaching fall? Oh, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Bring it on. It was the stormiest autumn Iceland had seen in years. The phone started ringing probably about five in the morning. He said that the base camp had blown away in the night. Ozen got drunk and wrecked the house. Winds regularly got up to hurricane force speed which is even more of a problem when your main set is on top of a mountain facing the sea. I hate this job. I want to go home. It's cold, miserable, and I'm about to get badly injured. Mark just about went off the road with five people in the car. Just about? Yeah. Holy shit. Did that just shatter? It did. That window yep. is shattered. No. We lost eight vehicles in that storm. That set, by the way, Oh, it caught fire. Hey, get these people out of here right now. The Viking longship leased by the production had been sitting on dry land for years and leaked badly. We have a leaky boat. It's a metaphor for the film. Morale was low. Nothing seemed to go right. Six rolls of film were mysteriously damaged somewhere in the process, and no one could figure out how or why that happened. Jan, the director of photography, and myself were arguing. Sterla and Ari were arguing. The actors were arguing. I mean, talk about acts of God. They've had, they've had pretty much everything except for the local volcano going active, and, and, or let's say an earthquake. Early this morning, a nearby volcano erupted. But through it all, director Sterla Gunnarsson was full of demented optimism. This bloody sunshine is killing me. Which you kind of have to be in that situation. After all, shooting in Iceland was Storla's idea. It's not exactly as if anybody said, well, let's try and make this easy. I think certain people have tried to say, let's try and make this really difficult because that's how films should be made. You should suffer for your art. You hear that a lot in this documentary. But you have to pay for your art to suffer, don't you? Finally in November, with the Icelandic winter firmly setting in, Storla finished filming his Viking movie. The cast and crew were exhausted, but happy to be done and proud of their accomplishment. Though the work had been extremely hard, they felt that all the pain and misery was ultimately worth it. You know, with these locations and this weather and the story and what it involved and, you know, it's driven people crazy. But I can't help thinking that when we see the final movie, we'll go, you know, that's why we suffered. Here's the thing. While I absolutely adore Beowulf and Grendel, the simple fact of the matter is most people think it kind of sucks. Nobody really went to see it. Was it worth it uh, financially? No. And critics didn't particularly like it. It hasn't found new life online or developed a cult following. It's been nearly 15 years since this movie came out. And in all that time, I've never met a single other person who has the same enthusiasm about it that I do. And who can really blame them? I'll die on the hill of defending this film, but I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it's perfect or some kind of masterpiece. It's really flawed. It drags in the second act, 
Some of the monster stuff looks fake and cheap. A lot of the editing is just bad. Then again, heroes. Why all the dead space? Then again, heroes. Isn't that better? The performances are uneven. Seeing that everything living dies, you still give me the sight of gods. Speak clean. You wonder of yourself. Sarah Polly did not want to be there. To be fair though, her character is basically a semen receptacle, so that's understandable. Now don't get me wrong, this movie is serious art through adversity. It has a grittiness to it that would not have been achieved if it was shot in a studio. Beowulf and Grendel had to be shot on a stormy mountain in Iceland. It has dirt under its fingernails, man, and you can't fake that. However, I can't help but think that some of the challenges that were faced by the cast and crew hurt the film as well as helped it. Sometimes I'll be watching a scene and I'll think, was that really your best take? I get the sense that if the filmmakers had a little more time and money, the final movie would have been a better product. But that's not how stories like this usually go. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good oh, story. shut the fuck up! In most stories like this, the movie that was so incredibly hard to make turns out to be amazing, and a huge hit, and everybody lives happily ever after. This ship carries the crest of Alderaan! Was there any other royal family on board? Who were you carrying? <sighs> That's not to say that we tend to think art through adversity is always good. Sometimes it absolutely blows. But those are two very different extremes. Most of the time, it's just really not that exciting. In reality, sometimes all of your hard work just doesn't pay off. It's a hard lesson, but if you've made a film or worked on one, you've learned it better than most. Every success story you read, every, you know, every entrepreneur that says, you've just got to focus on what you want, uh, ignore all the naysayers, there'll be people that'll try and bring you down, you've got to ignore them. You focus and you believe and you keep chasing that goal. And that's how I got successful. That is also a perfect recipe for failure. It's exactly how you fail, isn't it? It's exactly how you fail. But the difference is, the people that failed aren't writing those biographies. But maybe we're looking at this the wrong way. After all, making movies is hard. It will kill you if you let it. Maybe it's not a shame that Beowulf and Grendel didn't turn out better. Maybe we're just incredibly fortunate that this movie was finished at all. You have to ask you about that, that, that pagan blessing. Was it a blessing? Hilmar's blessing. Yeah. Before we started the production. Yeah. Yes, of course. You'd be so lucky, <laughs> Sterling. The day after... Any normal person wouldn't have to film at all. <laughs> we haven't had an earthquake, and there are still no frogs falling from the sky. So this we have to be thankful for.